Hey YouTube, it's Dimitri, and today we're gonna to talk about quant compensation from the perspective of graduating students. Um, this is gonna be video one. I'm going to do a second video on quant compensation throughout an entire career. So again, what can you expect in the long run? So I think a lot of students get these things mixed up. Um, but today we're just gonna talk about uh, quant careers from the graduating student perspective, what to expect for salaries, different positions as well. So a big thank you and shout out here to Carnegie Mellon. So I am working with CMU on this sorts of video because they actually provide me data and insight into what their graduates are making. So those that are just coming out of school. Uh, on the next video we'll do again with all the alumni information, they actually track the alumni uh, and there's a sampling method they do to get all this data and information and we'll see all their really big salaries for the future of the um, alumni. So again, stay tuned for that second video coming out here in another week. And as a small disclaimer here, I am working with CMU. So you can click the little link below. It's a little affiliate link. Uh, I get a little, basically a little kickback here thanking me for um, basically driving you to check out these reports. But all it really requires you to do is fill out your email address and a few information pieces about yourself. And then these reports are downloadable to you. These sorts of data though, I have not found from any other program. So even when I, you know, Dimitri Bianca, the fancy quant of YouTube, go out to do honorable mentions and rankings and whatnot, uh, a lot of programs don't want to give me information. And what I'm asking for is like this little tiny sliver of like what they did last year. Uh, Carnegie Mellon though is giving a ton of information, plus their insights, plus their perspectives uh, in these reports here. And I think these are really invaluable information that other programs are not providing. So I'd highly recommend that you guys go download these because I am not gonna cover every chart, every nuance of detail, um, but if you're looking to apply for programs, you're looking for quant finance just as a career and you don't even want to go to CMU, uh, I would highly recommend you at least look at these reports to get an idea of what a career is going to actually look like. So the document you're gonna to wanna to look at here when you go and you download these is going to be called the 2020 Career Guide. So they do not have a 2022 version of this. Um, the alumni report though is updated through 2022, uh, but the career guide, which is for the students here is through 2020. I think the first chart here though is extremely interesting because you will notice here, uh, they compare 2008 to 2018. So a 10 year gap here. And if you look at the number one position here, it's going to be financial modeling strategies and research here. Uh, it made up 42% in 2008. It makes up 52% in 2018. It's running strong. And you'll kind of notice here when I talk about what quants actually do, and I view many of these other positions and roles in these charts as non-quants, um, risk management oddly is separated out, even though it banks, which we'll go through in the data here, probably in the next video, the nuanced weirdness of how it's separated or why it's separated. But uh, you'll see here though that those that build models, statistical mathematical models, right? That's gonna be the chunk of where quantitative finance and financial engineering grads go. So it doesn't surprise me to see it go from 42 to 52. It's still running strong. Uh, sales and trading has been one of those areas where it's been a good, easy way to get a foot in the door. And then a lot of people end up leaving sales and trading to go into quantitative research or portfolio management or other kind of areas that are more quant focused here. Again, there are quant jobs in the sales and trading side, but they're getting to be more and more rare as automation occurs. So it's not surprising we see 39% of the graduating class from CMU in 2008 is going into 16% uh, in 2018 years. So there's a huge fall, a huge drop in this. Um, I think there's a few market factors playing into this as well as kind of these firms become more and more mature and as uh, individuals end up specializing more and more instead of having full stack quants, I think a lot of these graduates are gonna find other careers in other areas. Uh, interesting enough though, quantitative portfolio management increased from 2% to 10%. So, you know, qu quantitative portfolio management, in my mind, it's like, we all know quant finance, there's books, there's papers, it's been around for quite a while now. And yet I still think it's still picking up steam. Uh, you're seeing a lot of quantum mental funds kind of exploding out now in the last, I don't know, 20 years here where there's more and more people kind of realizing they can do traditional finance and use common you know, sense and logic and financial knowledge and econometrics and whatnot. And we can apply quantitative methods such as econometrics, uh, but also like statistics and mathematics to these and make just better portfolio decisions here. So not surprising that is growing as well. Again, risk management seems to be fairly stable here. I would just lump that into financial modeling and research. And then, you know, data science in 2008, 
there weren't a lot of graduates here at Carnegie Mellon going into it. But when I went through grad school and graduated in 2014, um, I remember walking through the engineering buildings. So we were on an engineering campus and there was like this billboard TV set up and it was giving like updates on their like ML and AI data science program. And I thought, man, that's so cool. I have no idea what that is. Uh, and that was in 2014. So, you know, I don't believe there are hardly anyone in the industry in the quant finance realm and all the quant programs that were going into those sorts of fields. And now, of course, in, you know, this paper has 2018. I'm sure it's probably much higher than this now in 2022. But the data science role is kind of growing and expanding and getting to be a bigger area of where a lot of these students end up going here. And I think a lot of this is just coming straight from the fact uh, that you have the skill sets to do data science. Now, it doesn't differentiate on here if that's in the finance industry or if that is in the tech industry or in another industry, medical, whatever. There's a bunch of other industries you can go into in data science. Uh, but I, so as a personal perspective here, I don't like hiring pure data scientists typically for a variety of reasons. Uh, again, the focus in statistics and mathematics is not as strong as a quant. So I actually prefer hiring quants to do machine learning modeling. Um, when I work with people and train people, I teach and train you to do model development, which covers statistical, mathematical, and machine learning models all under one umbrella because it's really kind of the same thing here. So again, data science is booming. Like I mentioned in a previous video, I highly recommend everybody take at least one machine learning course uh, because you're going to be using it. You're going to be exposed to it, and it's a really good skill to market. But again, don't forget to focus on those core statistics and math classes that you're going to need to actually work in the industry here. Um, now, I'm not going to break this out. There's a cool little chart here on the industry. I'll leave that to you. You can sort through that and look at that. Again, there's a bunch of stuff in this report where uh, there's like, you know, perspectives, intakes, insights. Highly recommend you read all that just to get their perspective and what, you know, they're saying. Some of it's going to be a little bit different than what I agree with. Uh, but let's break down these areas here using their data and charts here and the skills required. So I went to New York, Chicago, um, Michigan, Ann Arbor, and I went and presented and I made a little chart in the top right corner of the skills I thought people needed based on different percentages here. Again, this is going to break down these different roles here. Uh, sales and trading, again, they, they have broken it down into 30% for data analytics and programming, 10% uh, for mathematics, finance and econometrics here is going to be 30% and statistics is going to be 30% here. So kind of even across the board, with math being really that light piece here. So again, sales and trading is going to be more on data analytics and programming, finance basically, and stats. And we'll go through these other ones here in a second. But you can scroll down here and you can see, which I think this is extremely helpful in the report. You want to go into sales and trading, what sorts of jobs should you be applying for? Uh, they just give you the list right here. Like these are the titles you should go look for because that's where you know, their students are getting placed in sales and trading. These are the entry level trading titles. And again, they all vary firm to firm. So it's nice to have this, you know, list of what they're actually called. Uh, salary though. So this is where I want to debunk a lot of this. I see a lot of students saying, Dimitri, I heard real quants are making like half a million dollars or more starting their first job. And it's like, I, I have a hard time answering this because yes, there are students and people that make a half million or more um, as a first starting job, except for those people are extremely rare. And often those people are extremely rare because they have also a very deep background. So they might be 30 years old with a PhD and a bunch of experience at you know, some other firm. Then they go back and get a master's degree. Uh, we'll talk about more on this sort of expertise experience and everything as we talk about uh, the alumni report. So the career spectrum for those that have been working in the industry, which is going to be the second video here. Uh, but no, most quants do not make millions of dollars starting the job. And people say, no, oh, Dimitri, you don't really know. And so I'm going to throw in another source here just to kind of bounce this off of. Uh, if you look at the 2022 QuantNet ranking, so I have zero affiliation with QuantNet at all. Uh, I'm basically their competitor when it comes to rankings. So I literally have like, I don't know, 100% reason to basically like, I don't know, not use them as a source here, but they have good data. And again, getting good data to come by is challenging. I'm not gonna say how much I think it is quality wise because programs don't always report things very accurately. Uh, but if you look at average starting base salary plus sign-on bonus, 
Uh, Baruch comes in at number one, 152,483. I would put money that most of these are going to be quant dev roles, which I don't view as real quants. Um, again, it's computer scientists here. You can also make this type of money or much better in the tech industry doing software engineering. Uh, but again, you see like the top few programs, you know, 152, 143, 125, 138, 119. And then as we start getting into the programs six and below, we really start to drop below 100,000. So, you know, Columbia here is at 106, you know, I use it 103, uh, Tandon and I use 96 and it goes down. You can scroll. There's some here that are 118 with NC state, which is pretty good to be honest with you, which is why they were on my rankings, I believe last year, or if not, they were invited. Uh, again, University of Minnesota is coming in pretty low at 79. Um, Lehigh is coming in at 63. Again, they're going to drop in here around like the probably around the 80s. And I've been saying this for years, guys. Uh, entry level quant rolls typically pay about 80. Uh, if you're in New York City, you should be probably pulling in somewhere around 100. Again, if you look at a lot of these programs, though, uh, not surprising. Most of the programs that are going to be in the tri state area are the programs that are going to be. Uh, with higher salaries. They also have much, much higher costs of living here. So uh, Dallas, Texas, I would expect you to bank anywhere between like 80 and 100 starting. And that being said, you'd have to have a lot, some experience and other factors in there, depending where you fall in that range between 80 and 100. Uh, Dallas for me is twice or half the cost of living is New York City. So New York costs me twice as much as living in Dallas. So the fact that like NC State, for example, uh, is at 118, uh, that's stellar. Guys, if you're like living in North Carolina making 118, like you're living the dream compared to these guys in New York City here, even like at 130, 140. So this is just to give you a little idea and a little nuanced detail here, which I want to make sure. Uh, this is plus sign-on bonus. So when I took my first job, I banked 80 in Dallas. Plus I had a $10,000 sign-on bonus moving bonus kind of thing here. So, I mean, I'm coming in at 90 here back in 2014. Prices have not moved that much. Uh, again, you can see like UW is around 90. Uh, Boston University is around 90. Stony Brook's around 90. So, you know, getting the idea here that, you know, salaries are not going to be three, four, five hundred thousand dollars $500,000, which we see a lot online, a lot of discussions about. And we always say this to Dimitri, but those are real quants. Uh, I'm so tired of hearing that because most of those people that are real quants aren't actually doing quant work. Uh, most of them are just software engineers. So I'm not going to get too much in that rabbit hole. But that puts us with a little bit of a starting point here before we dive in here on uh, Carnegie Mellon's data. And you can see here from the 2020 data here, um, which I absolutely love here. Again, they're giving you the, the minimum, they're giving you the maximum, they're giving you the mean, they're giving you the medium. This is all information we are not getting on other sites and sources. All right, and you can see here that sales and trading is coming in somewhere like around 100 to 105 here. If you look at like the median to the mean, and of course, there are people getting up to 125. Again, I would argue these are probably people that already have experience or people that already have another degree. So they might have a master's or a PhD already. Um, and then again, the sign-on bonus here, the median is 10,000. The mean is 20,000. That is a huge gap. Um, the low is 6,000 and the upper is 50,000. So that that is a crazy spread here. And again, it'd be awesome to like really dig into the data if they had even more detailed data. But I'm curious, like the person making 125 is probably going to be one of those people that's getting around 50,000. Uh, I also don't know how far, like that 50,000 looks like to be an outlier because the mean and the median um, are so far to the left on the bottom end of this range here. But again, sales and trading, awesome career start here. Again, between 100 and 105 is probably what to expect here for the starting salary um, I'd estimate probably about $10,000, what you'd probably pick up for a signing bonus. That's pretty standard here if you're going to get one. Uh, the second role, though, is going to be financial modeling strategies and research here. So again, if you build models for a living, this is what real quants do. Real quants, I'll put them in air quotes here. Uh, yeah, this is what quants do. We build math and stats models. And in my head, the further and deeper into a career I go, I start to realize it's really hard to differentiate what is actually math and stats and probability and econometrics. Even you start tying all this in we're just, you know, we're estimating coefficients, which is like, I have a math equation I have to find. So F of X, I don't know, it can be like defaults on a, a loan portfolio. It could be, you know, portfolio optimization. It could be risk adjusted value at risk, or, you know, there can be like, I guess, risk adjusted value of portfolios. Anyways, there can be all kinds of things you're modeling, which is just f of x, right? It's some equation. 
and you need to find whatever that equation is and you need to come up with estimates of that. Um, so it shouldn't be surprising here that, you know, a large, large chunk of this is mathematics. Stats still makes up, I guess, a smaller percentage compared to the other roles here. That's what they at least list out here. Um, the finance and economics piece, again, 20%, but data analytics, 20%. That math piece, though, that's really where you're going to see a heavy lift. Uh, again, financial modeling, I think, is fairly different than strategies where research and financial modeling are going to be closer to related. It'd be nice to see those split out because strats teams typically focus more on the analytics and the programming side, uh, where those that are typically in like solid research roles or those that are doing a lot of um, model development, like at a bank, uh, you'd be doing a lot of math and stats. So again, this is a real good quant position here. Uh, and the salary here, again, is not surprising between 100 and 105 here. So you can see the numbers are a little bit different. The range is between 80 and 125. Uh, the bonuses is about the same. Instead of between 6,000 and 50, we're looking at about 5,000 and 40,000. But I will note this. Uh, these roles typically have a higher sign-on bonus. You know, if you look at the mean and the median, though, instead of between 10 and 20, we're looking at 23 with the actual median being 25,000. But again, about 23 to 25 grand for a sign-on bonus plus 100 grand. Uh, you know, that's a really good starting role there. Um, quantitative portfolio managers. So again, this is going to be stats focused. Uh, again, finance and econ focus. This is the largest piece of this because if you're working in quantitative portfolio management, uh, portfolio management is going to be more focused on looking at products. So those that work in like risk management and financial modeling, for example, you typically get pigeonholed in down the rabbit hole on a very, very specific product and you're just modeling that product and a lot of things tied to that product. Um, but when you work in, you know, portfolio management here, you're going to be looking at more of the holistic view. And you're also going to need to know a little bit more about all these different types of products here. So it's not surprising um, that the finance kind of economic side here is going to be 30%. Again, stats is going to be a big portion of that because, again, you're doing like optimization equations, Um or you can use like, you can call it statistics here, uh, but using stats here to kind of find ways of how we construct these portfolios, which is going to be the main focus here for quantitative portfolio management. Um, again, the, probably the math is reported as a bit lower here just because, um, you know, there's probably not a lot of pure math going into this. It's just a lot of stats and finance here coming up with different types of, again, portfolios we talked about and measuring the risk behind those portfolios. So I think that's an important thing to think about. Data analytics and programming makes 20%. But overall, there's a good, well-rounded set of skills here and requirements. The mean and median salary here seems to be a bit higher. So if you're going to be looking for a higher base salary, uh, we're looking at the median about 108 and the mean of 115. So this is kind of a growing area where, you know, when you see growth in an area, the demand's higher than typically the supply available for those that are specialized in this area. The sign-on bonuses are still fairly strong here with about eighteen dollars to $20,000 for your sign-on bonus. Again, even the lowest one they had here is, you know, 10000 The highest was twenty five. So we're not seeing as crazy of ranges as we did with the other roles. But your uh, starting salary is going to be much higher. Again, here's the entry-level titles. So investment analyst, quantitative analyst, portfolio management analyst, quantitative research associate, and research analyst. Uh, again, it's hard to really differentiate a lot of these, right? So quantitative research associate, right? Is that different than uh, quantitative research, which we talked about up here? Uh, often it just depends which areas of quant finance you're working in. So you work on the sell side, which is the banking side. Uh, you might see a little bit lower salary, but you'll see less stress. Uh, again, quantitative portfolio management also seems quite broad on if you're working for a hedge fund, you're working for someone that's doing, you know, like prop trading, for example, or you're working for someone that's doing like, you know, retirement accounts and 401ks and they're managing, I don't know, wealth management for high, high net individuals here. So you might have a little bit less stress in that scenario. Again, stress equals compensation. It's tied to the markets and markets when you're having to, you know, follow those markets and really be on top of things, you're going to have higher stress and you should see a little bit more bump in your compensation here. All right, now so for risk management here. So I think this is a little bit lacking uh, in their description of it, but I think it does give a honest and truthful perspective of this as well. Uh, if you want, I'll put a little tag above as well. You can look at the videos I've had on what model validation is, which is just half of the equation of risk management at a bank. So there's development and validation. Uh, but again, it does mention here like, you know, the Dodd-Frank Act, which was, for example, like CCAR, those are going to be things that you're going to be modeling. Again, it's still modeling. It's still research. Uh, it's just focused 
at a bank here. And again, 40% of this is going to be stats. 20% is finance. Math quite small at 15%. Uh, and the programming analytics is 25%. I would full heartedly agree with this <laughs> kind of breakdown of this. Banks use SaaS, at least most banks do. Uh, some are moving into Python now, like Wells Fargo, for example. But SAS is a stats language. It does nothing but statistics. We just build statistical models all day, every day. You can call some of the math models if you want it, I guess. Um, but most of what we do is going to be focused around statistical modeling here, time series modeling. So, you know, like Serimax models. Uh, credit score is going to be like, you know, gradient boosting decision trees, logistic regression, uh, OLS regression. Like there's a wide range of things we're going to be doing. But a lot of the job here is really focused on uh, the banking sectors, you're going to be quite pigeonholed typically in two different areas like credit risk, market risk, operational risk, or regulatory risk, which would specifically be like CCAR, um, IFRS 9, for example, or CSOL. Um, again, all these different areas are risk management. They just call it risk management at a bank because it doesn't sound good to regulators to say we have a whole team of quants. Uh, after the 2007-2008 financial crisis, quants kind of a dirty word as it elicits a lot of like gambling and risk taking and, you know all that stuff with the 2007, 2008 financial crisis. So we just call them risk managers here. In compensation, it looks like there is 105,000 basically is what they've kind of listed here. Uh, the mean sign-on bonus is gonna be about 24 to 25,000, which is pretty good. And again, here's a bunch of just titles here, what they're going to call them uh, for entry level risk roles. I would add in here, which these seem kind of odd for risk management. Uh, most risk management titles are going to be called something like model development or model validation. So it could be, you know, an associate model developer, associate model validator, or it could be like a validation role. So associate or AVP or something like that for model validation. Uh, again, if you list things out here, they have like AVP of asset and liability management. That's just one very specific area inside of that. Again, market risk analyst, same thing. Uh, treasury risk, I think it's kind of an odd one in there, but uh, also look for like, you know, AVP of credit risk management. Do not, do not go into cre uh, credit analytics or credit analyst. A uh, credit analyst is a non-quanti person. They just focus on uh, like data analytics. They don't do actual quant model development. So just kind of a little disclaimer there. And then finally here, let's look at data science here. So data science, they say is 40% data analytics and programming, 40% statistics. Uh, not surprising, the finance part and the math part's quite small because data science is really nothing more than computer scientists trying to do statistics. So, right, you would expect the programming side and the statistics side to be the largest pieces here. Uh, this is probably the most skewed portion here. Again, your financial knowledge is going to play a minor role because a lot of the data science roles are going to be outside of finance and banking. Um, again, math, for some reason, good rigorous mathematics is not usually taught or done or constructed uh, during data science master's programs. I'm just telling you this from my experience of working with people who have had data science degrees uh, and have made it into the industry. Uh, also from talking to people that have data science degrees and went into other industries as well here. So again, the main focus is gonna be programming, 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 and doing some stats and basically machine learning, which is a type of statistics here. Um, but there's also some awesome uh, job titles here, I think that are a little bit creative and what firms have called them. So a little bit, you know, things to look at if you want to do data science. Um, some are still called financial engineers, apparently. Uh, research science or associate, which is going to be something somewhat unique to the data science titles here. Again, quant analytics and model development. So most people that are developing models in general are going to be doing stats and machine learning. So you kind of need that full base and that full spectrum here. Uh, salary wise, though, Again, 105 to 107. Um, we're looking at the sign-on bonus here, 7,500. So I'm guessing the sample size of this data is not really high either. So there's not a lot of people receive bonuses with this. Or I don't know, there's not a lot of data points because it's weird the mean and the median are the exact same. But in general here, right, I think the whole takeaway here is when you graduate with these, one of these quant masters here, even as good as Carnegie Mellon, and for those of you that don't know, Carnegie Mellon is one of the first, if not the first, I believe they claim to be the first somewhere in there. There's a couple, I think, kind of going, but Carnegie Mellon is basically like the first uh, quant finance master's degree ever. And then on top of that, they've maintained a really high ranking and standard and quality over the years here. And as you can see from any of these, uh, the average starting salary is going to be like around 100. 
But again, that's the average. Let me emphasize that. That is the average. Uh, there's going to be people below the average. There's going to be people above the average. Uh, start to think about, though, where you're living. So if you're living in New York City, you're living in, you know, Dallas, Texas, or you're living in, I don't know, Charlotte, North Carolina, or you're living in Seattle or, you know, L.A. or somewhere. Think about the cost of living in this factor, too, because they might pay you slightly more. Uh, but firms do not pay you um, the gap of what it costs to live there, especially now with working from home. Uh, you know, you can get paid a low salary and choose to live in New York City or Chicago or somewhere else that's more expensive, or you can choose to live somewhere that's a little bit cheaper here. So these are things to consider when looking at jobs. So the conclusion of this video, how much do quants really make coming out of a master's degree? The answer is really around $100,000, depending on a bunch of factors. If you start breaking those factors out, uh, for example, you work in you know a cheaper city, you should expect somewhere between like 80 to 100. Uh, if you're gonna be somewhere that's far more expensive like New York City, uh, I would expect somewhere between like 800 and, you know, like 110. That's probably a decent range to be in. Uh, but again, you might even see salaries. I had friends that came out of uh, financial engineering masters that were making 80,000 in New York City, which if you're not quite certain, 80,000 in New York City does not take you very far, uh, especially if you want an apartment of your own, you don't want to have a bunch of roommates here. So these are just kind of things to think about. So Anyways, this is the breakdown. This is really what quants are making, around 100 grand coming out here. Uh, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Definitely hit the little bell notification if you want the notification because next week's video is going to be the alumni report and we are gonna talk about all the compensation details and there's a lot more information uh, in that report than there is in this one. Again, don't forget to download this report if you want more information and insight on kind of these charts and their perspective of what's going on across time. Anyways, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. And as always, until next time.